Would you welcome my friend, a uh, friend of the Joshua Fund, Ann Graham Lotz. Very special to be here with you. Very special to be here with Joel. And um, I probably shouldn't say this in front of him, but I would probably do just about anything he asked. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason we met at Edmonton years and years ago is because I was uh, in Raleigh in my hometown, and um, I was listening to the radio, and the interviewer was interviewing this guy who was they described him as the Notre Dame of novelists. And so I perked up, and then he started to describe what he was, I had ri just written. And I thought, well, that guy has to know the Bible if he's going to write like that. And then he said, I'm a born-again Christian. I'm a um, Messianic Jew. And he was talking about the Ezekiel option at that time. So uh, after the interview, I just drove straight to Barnes & Noble. I picked up his book because I love novels. I read novels all the time. And uh, then I had to work my way backwards in that series. And I've read every single one of his books, um, the novels and the others also. He's a, um, the smartest man I know, actually. <laughs> I don't know how he writes what he does. But, um, but I love his heart for God's people. And, um, and, uh, and Joel, you know, it's so interesting because God moved him to Jerusalem. But, but it was almost as though it was more for the Arab countries and, and Israel's neighbors. I know it's for Israel, but the, the doors that God has opened for Joel, is, it's supernatural and divine appointments. Uh, and it's been amazing to watch. So, and it's not been easy. I know it's not easy to move your four boys into there and you know, learn the language and join the army and all the stuff that they had to do. But, um, but we just thank you and appreciate you so much and appreciate you for supporting him and being a part of what God's called him to. So I'm honored to be here and humbled. And of course, he assigned me this passage. <laughs> and I don't usually take assigned passages, but I believe it's God's message. It's just not familiar. So I'm going to stumble my way through it and pray that um, you'll get the message. So pray with me. So Lord Jesus, we come before you now and we thank you and praise you for your presence here. Thank you for what we're about Thank you that the people here have a heart for your people, not only within the church, but within the nation of Israel and Jews and Gentiles. So Lord, I ask now, like little Samuel, that you would speak to us, that as we choose to open our ears and listen, that we would hear the soft whisper of the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts, and that we would respond in a way that brings pleasure to you in a way that's in accordance with your will. We ask your blessing on this message, not because we deserve it, but because we ask in Jesus' name. And if you don't bless us, we're not going to be blessed. And so we just ask for you to give us everything you want us to have after a full morning. Just enlarge our capacity to receive, we pray. And we ask now for your blessing and thank you for it in advance because we're asking in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Joel referenced 9-11, and we're coming up on the 20th anniversary. And uh, he said last night that he remembered exactly where he was when that took place, and all of us do. You know, we all can tell you where uh, we were. I was at home, like Joel said he was, and my daughter called, turn on the TV. I turned on the TV and time to see the first plane in the trade tower, and then the second plane, I watched it hit, and then the first tower imploded, and the second, and I remember putting my hand over my face and wanting to cry out like, no, God, no, you know, you want to stop it. This is just because I knew I was watching on my television screen people stepping into eternity. And I wondered, are they stepping into eternity, but they're not ready to meet God? And are they not ready to meet God because people like me haven't shared the gospel with them? So the impact of 9-11 on me was that I fell on my knees and made a recommitment to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we fast forward to Afghanistan. And you've seen the pictures coming out of Afghanistan. And one picture that's almost as indelibly impressed on my mind as the trade towers coming down was that picture of the hundreds of people running across the tarmac, uh, clinging to the evacuation plan, climbing into the wheel wells. When the plane took off, the people were dropping down to their deaths. And I thought, that's a picture of people desperate to be saved. And then it's like the Spirit just whispered, and there are people all over the world 
who are desperate to be saved. Not just physical salvation, but spiritual salvation. So I got on my knees again, and I recommitted my recommitment <laughs> to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Years ago, um, I was teaching my Bible class. I wasn't traveling. I wasn't on the road, so I wasn't out there, you know. I got a call from a missions organization, a great one, actually, international, and they asked me if I would give the keynote address at their annual convention. And it was such a random invitation. I asked them, why did you ask me? And they said, well, we know you have a heart for the gospel. And when I hung up the phone, I thought about that. Why did They don't know me. Why did they say I have a heart for the gospel? And then I thought, you know, it's because I'm Billy Graham's daughter. And that put me on my knees. And so I asked the Lord to show me if I had a heart for the gospel. And what he showed me is that, yes, I had a heart for the gospel, but it was too small. And so I prayed that he would enlarge my heart for the gospel. And I believe he's answered that prayer to the point that now when the secular press tries to describe me. They describe me as an evangelist, and I'm not. I've asked the Lord to give me that gift, but he's withheld it from me. And, um, but I think what they're seeing is the answer to that prayer that God has given me an enlarged heart for the gospel. So what I want to ask you, I know because you're part of Joshua Fund, I know that you have a heart for the gospel. But I wonder if, like me, do you need an enlarged heart for the gospel? So if you have your Bible on your phone, your tablet, you have a hard copy like I do, Romans chapter 1, the first 17 verses, is the text for this message. And there are three characteristics of a heart for the gospel that I see in this text. And I'll take them one by one, but I'll give them to you. A heart for the gospel is conscious of God's call, convinced of God's compassion, confident in God's cross. So first of all, a heart for the gospel is conscious of God's call. Seven times in the, excuse me, four times in the first seven verses, Paul refers to calling. And he says in verse one, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. And he describes himself as a servant, which is a beautiful picture because a servant is someone who is obedient to his master's voice and attentive to his master's uh, every desire and submissive to his master's will, doing his master's work. It's a, a beautiful picture of being called to Jesus. And verse 6 says, you also are called. And our first calling, can I just lay it down? Our first calling is to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, to put our faith in him, to serve him, to obey him, to love him, to get to know him, to bring him glory. So our first call is to him. Years ago, I went through a, an Isaiah 6 experience where for seven days, God just raked me through the coals, you know, convicted me of sin after sin after sin in my life. I didn't know I had, and I was in ministry. And when he finished, and he let me know he was finished, I felt just wiped out, spiritually depleted, but I also had this huge sense of unworthiness. How can I go back into ministry when I've just gone through this experience? So I asked the Lord for a recall, and he took me to 1 Corinthians 1, 9, and I put my name in it. So, Ann, you're called to fellowship with Jesus Christ. And I thought, you know, I can do that. I love to spend time with him. I love to hear his voice. I want to be obedient to his word. I want to be surrendered to his will. And, and I knew my first calling was to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just make that clear. But we're called to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of making him known, for sharing the gospel. And Paul says in verse 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, set apart for the gospel of God. He knew what his mission was. It was to present the gospel. And if you gave Paul a chance to tell you his testimony, I know you know it, but uh, Pharisee of the Pharisees, zealous for the law, and was right there when Stephen was stoned to death, holding the cloaks of those who were stoning him. And, uh, and then he was so enraged and so filled with zeal um, and what he felt like was uh, protection of God's holiness in his name that he went out and he began to persecute Christians. He dragged them out of their homes. He put them in prison. And then he heard there were some Christians up in Damascus. He got the letters from the authorities to go up to Damascus and arrest the Christians there. And on the Damascus road, <laughs> there's a brilliant white light. 
And he heard a voice out of heaven saying, and this is Acts 26, Saul, and you know Saul as Paul before conversion, same guy. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness. So, so look at that last phrase, to appoint you as a servant, called to Jesus first, right? And then as a witness for the purpose of sharing the gospel and making him known. So, so this is my point. The moment Paul was converted, he was called. Are you converted? Then you've been called. The story of the old missionary who came home on furlough and he was standing in front of the congregation that had sent him out and supported him and he was giving a report on what he'd been doing and then he said, you know, I've never been called to share the gospel. There's this collective gasp that goes up and what have we been supporting you for, you know? And, and then he said, I haven't been called, just commanded like the rest of you. And I think a call of God becomes a command when we hear the call with our name on it. It happened for me in 1974. Uh, my husband and I went to Lausanne, Switzerland for the International Congress on World Evangelism. And we heard speaker after speaker after speaker. It was, it was a great congress. And we came home and my reaction <laughs> was, you know, that was a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of organization put into something that would not be necessary, at least in the United States, if people like me were sharing the gospel with our neighbors. And I had never shared the gospel with my neighbors. So before I lost my nerve, <laughs> I picked up the phone, I called my neighbors, I invited them for coffee, I came into the house, and we talked about nothing for an hour because I was just trying to work up nerve to share the gospel and... Finally, I didn't even make a transition. I just blurted out why I asked him to my house for coffee and uh, shared the gospel. And the, one of them got up and hit the door. She just ran out of the house. <laughs> and the others started talking about baptism and the churches they went to and, you know, all that. And um, I just made such a mess of it. But can I tell you, within two years, every single one of my neighbors came to faith in Jesus Christ. Two of them went on to become Christian leaders in the community. So, when have you heard God's call with your name on it? It becomes a command to go into all the world, the world between your own two feet, and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, are you conscious of God's call? Paul was conscious of God's call. He knew what his mission was. It was to share the gospel. He knew what his message was. Oh, let's be clear. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 9, verse 15, verse 16, verse 17 is God's gospel. That's the message. And he promised it. He said in verse 2, the gospel he promised beforehand. Do you remember back in Genesis 3.15? I'm going to send the seed of a woman who will crush the serpent's head, bring you back into a right relationship with your creator. That's my paraphrase. And then all the way through the Old Testament, I'm going to send a prophet like you, he said to Moses, who will deliver you not from slavery but from sin. And go on, you have Isaiah 53, that incredible passage that by his stripes we would be healed and... Oh, it was promised in the Old Testament through the prophets. Jeremiah 31, 31. This is an interesting one to share with Jews when God said, I'm going to give you a new covenant. And Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took the cup representing his blood, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant God promised through Jeremiah. So our message is the gospel and he, he promised it in verse 2, provided it through his son in verse 3, and then he proved it when he raised Jesus from the dead in verse 4. So our message is not politics, it's not programs, it's not philosophy, it's not prosperity, it's not equity, it's not equality, because listen to me, you can solve, you know, the racial problem, you can eliminate nuclear weapons, you can reverse global warming. You can uh, feed the hungry and house the homeless and clothe the naked and eliminate abortion on demand and redistribute wealth so the rich aren't so rich and the poor aren't so poor. And listen to me, they will all go to 
hell. Can I just tell you? So our message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is the gospel? Wish I had time to go into it in depth, but you know it. I hope we never get over the wonder of it. John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish. You would not go to hell, but you would have everlasting life. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, oh, listen to me, no one, no Jew, no Gentile, no Baptist, no Buddhist, no Methodist, no Muslim, no one. No agnostic, no atheist, no theologian, no one will come to the Father except they come through me. Acts 4.12, there's no other name given under heaven among men where you can be saved, just the name Jesus. So in our cancel culture, in this woke society in which we're living, you and I have to be guarded against compromising, watering down the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not wanting to offend people. We want to be tolerant. We want to be inclusive to the point that we have to be careful that we're not speaking the truth boldly. I loved Mike Pompeo last night. I just thought he was such a great, I've not been around him before, but love the fact that he just lets it right out there that he's a born again evangelical Christian and, uh, and doesn't care who knows that and he just makes it so plain. Um, so don't let the enemy intimidate you into silence or even to holding back. We share the gospel with love, certainly, with cultural sensitivity, with appreciation for where the other person is coming from, but our message is the gospel. So a heart for the gospel is conscious of God's call to the person of Jesus Christ for the purpose of sharing the gospel. We know the mission is to share the gospel. We know the message is the gospel, okay? Second characteristic. Heart for the gospel is convinced of God's compassion. For God so loved the world. Just wrap your mind around that. So if I can give you a big picture and I'll use a baseball game, and um, my son-in-law trainer is here. He was a, on scholarship with Baylor University on the baseball team, so I know he thinks this is sort of silly, simplistic, I guess, but it's the truth, right? So um, when a batter gets up to bat at the baseball game, uh, the pitcher throws him the ball, and he swings the bat. If he misses, that's strike one, okay? And then he gets a second chance. So the batter gets up to the plate, and he, uh, if the pitcher throws him the ball, he swings the bat, he misses the second time, that's strike two. So he gets a third chance, and the pitcher throws him the ball, he swings the bat, he misses, that's strike three. And I know there are other factors in there, but three strikes and you're out, right? So let me apply that to Genesis 1 to 11. The world of humanity represented by Adam and Eve were created to know God, to fellowship with God, to enjoy God, to serve with God, and the world of humanity represented by Adam and Eve said, you know, we don't want what God wants. We want what we want more than what he wants, and they disobeyed God. That was strike one, and he removed them from the garden. So God gave them a second chance in Genesis chapter 6. And in Genesis chapter 6, God announced to the whole world, I'm going to send judgment on the whole world because your thoughts and words are only evil all the time, but nobody paid any attention. It was like nobody was listening, except one man, Noah, who was... And God saved the human race through Noah, but the world of humanity was destroyed in that flood. That was strike two. So then we come to the third strike. And in Genesis 10 and 11, we have the Tower of Babel. The world of humanity gathered at the plain of Shinar, building a, a tower that would reach to heaven in essence saying, we're not going to come to God the way he said. We can work our own way into heaven. We can build our own religious system. We can come through our own good works, our own philosophies. And that was strike three. And God confused their languages, scattered them out all over the world. And where they still are today, by the way. The descendants of those who were in such rebellion, defiance, disobedience at the Tower of Babel are everywhere. 
in their rebellion, defiance, and disobedience against God. But God so loved the world that he reached down and he picked up Abraham. And he worked through Abraham and his family to give us what we know as our Old Testament, to give us the laws and the ceremonies and the sacrifices to teach us that we're sinners, that the law, we could never keep it. We needed a Savior. And then John the Baptist is standing beside the Jordan River, and he sees Jesus of Nazareth walking by, and he says, look, there goes the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. And the world was back in the game. So are you convinced that God loves the whole world? Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians, Iranians, Iraqis, the Taliban, the Afghans, the Africans, the Russians, Americans, Europeans, Asians. God loves the whole world. And Joel, I just want to affirm you, I love the fact that you reach out to the neighbors of Israel. You know, God loves Israel's neighbors as much as God loves Israel, but his purpose for them is different, okay? God sent his son to die for them every bit as much as he sent his son to die for you and for me and for any Jew that's ever existed. So are you convinced that God loves the whole world? Verse 7, Paul says to all who are in Rome who are loved by God, and Rome was the world. So Rome was outside of the descendants of Abraham. I'm assuming that after Pentecost, uh, somebody that was there who was saved went to Rome, founded a church because there were people in that Roman church who came to Christ before Paul came to Christ. And ro that Roman church represented the world. And so Paul is writing to the Roman church and he was informed about what was going on in there. He said, verses 7 and 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is reported all over the world. Paul heard the reports. He knew what was going on. He was informed of what was happening in the Christian community. Are you? And thank the Lord for the Joshua Fund, for all Israel news, for services that keep us informed as to what's taking place in the community outside our Bible study, outside of our church, outside of our community. We want to know what's going on in the world. So how informed are you? And I think, I know you're involved in the Joshua Fund. I suggest you also download, if you haven't, the Christian Broadcasting Network's app, the news app, so you can just check the news. I think the best Christian magazine that informs you about what's going on in the world is Billy Graham Evangelistic Association's magazine, Decision. And just make sure that you're informed, not just about your little niche, you know, but, but the world at large. The reason for that is because when we're informed, it leads us to intercede. And Paul says in verses 9 to 10, God whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayer at all times. He prayed for the Roman church. And he prayed for them because of the information he had received. So who do you pray for? Several years ago, and I'm like, Joel, I can't remember dates anymore, you know, but it was several years ago, <laughs> I was invited to be a part of the National Broadcasters Association delegation to Israel. So I went to Israel with a very special group of people, and one of the things we did, we went down to a farming community on the Gaza border, and it was when the missiles were just raining like, like rain, you know, just coming in thick and fast. And we went to this little farming community, and they said, when you hear the siren go off, you have 30 seconds to get into a bunker. The siren went off. We all dashed into the bunker. I was <laughs> on my face in the bunker. And then you come out, and the Iron Dome has taken out the missile. You see the puff looks like a little white cloud, but it's not. It's the missile that's been exploded. We went in the underneath bunker, and we were briefed. 
and the head of that community, she was head of the security for the community, she was five months pregnant, and she was terrified. And the little guy that showed us around was just a farmer, and I remember his eyes just so wide with terror. And while we were there, his home was hit by a missile, and his wife, excuse me, his mother and his baby were not there, thank goodness, but his home was hit, and when we left, we were in the car and the siren went off. In a four-lane highway, we had to get out of the car, lay face down in a ditch, and look up and you see the puff of smoke where the missile had been taken out by the Iron Dome. And I came back, and I want to tell you something. I was angry. How could this be? How could people who are trying to make a living and farm in their community and grow crops and you know, have babies and raise children. How can it be that they have to live in that kind of horror and terror for no other reason than they exist? There wasn't anything they were doing to provoke the Palestinian attack. It's just because Israel is there. And I came back, and I'm going to tell you, that information was heavy on my heart like a burden leading me to intercede. And for me, it's hard for me to keep my concentration in prayer. I don't know if sometimes you have that. And so I write down my prayers from time to time. And so I wrote down a prayer that actually was about an hour long. And I posted it on our website, invited people to pray with me. And we had about 25,000 people who joined me in prayer. It was called 911, just, and it's still on our website if you want to look it up, but 911 prayer for Israel, and I brought a portion of it to read to you so you can understand how the information leads to intercession. Just, you know, I believe the information allows God to give us the burden that's on his heart so that we can then ask him for what he's wanting to give us. So this was a, a portion of my prayer. Our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are the eternal I am. We know that you so love the world that you gave us heaven's treasure when you sent your only son to die so that anyone and everyone who places their faith in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Yet we also know that your great heart of love still longs to pour out your blessing on the city and the people that you have uniquely chosen as your own. Jerusalem, the house of Israel, the Jews. We pray with compulsion for the peace of Jerusalem and for the whole house of Israel. Your people and the city that bear your name are surrounded by a vast multitude of hostile, evil men seeking to kill and destroy. And now these demonic forces are on the verge of being equipped with nuclear weapons. Your people are subjected to the continuing barrage of enemy missiles Mortars that are destroying farms and families, incendiary balloons, communities and children while dealing with a raging pandemic. While one ceasefire after another promises peace, when Israel's land is divided and surrendered for peace, when people cry out for peace, peace, there is no peace. Are you not the God who rules over the nations? Power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. So we are compelled to pray for your people because they're facing their enemies without the strength, wisdom, peace, comfort, security, hope that you reserve for those who are indwelt by your spirit through faith in your son Jesus. They have no deep blessed assurance that their sins are forgiven, that eternal life is theirs, that a heavenly home is waiting to welcome them. We ask, great creator God, that you give sight to those born spiritually blind. Open the eyes of your people to see you for who you truly are. Don't let their sight be dimmed or distorted by centuries of religiosity and rejection of the truth. Open their eyes to Jesus as their Messiah. Then show up in great power, giving your people supernatural strength to withhold vengeance, to execute justice, to remember mercy, to walk humbly as they acknowledge that victory will be won, not by their might, nor by their own power, but by your spirit. Yet we do ask you for victory over the enemy. In the name of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, in the name of the Messiah, in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, amen.
So when I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I'll be honest with you, I don't believe there'll be peace in Jerusalem, not permanent peace. I don't care how many people sign that Abraham Accords. There won't be peace until the Prince of Peace comes back and establishes it. But we can pray for it. And every time I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm saying, Lord Jesus, please come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, especially right now before Rosh Hashanah, so <laughs> Feast of Trumpets, you know, just looking up. Zechariah 12.10 says that one day the Jews are going to look on the one whom they've pierced and mourn as for an only son, mourn because for 2,000 years they've rejected the one who is their Messiah. And that mourning is going to be repentance and they're going to turn to Jesus. And Paul says in Romans eleven twenty six that one day all of Israel will be saved. I don't know if that means every single person, but it's going to be a messianic nation. So if you're convinced of God's compassion that he loves the whole world, then you'll be informed about what's going on and that leads you to intercede. And then you get involved. He's, Paul is writing this letter. He's planning a visit. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about networking in the Joshua Fund because you can um, learn opportunities to get involved and ask them. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've given many ideas this morning, but just something strikes your heart and quickens you and get involved. Because, Paul said, he was indebted. Verse 14, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. So Paul had been part of that rebellious humanity, defying God. He thought he was, you know, protecting God's name and all that, but actually he was defying them and coming against him. And Jesus said, you're persecuting me. And so then Paul, when he was saved by God's grace, not by his works, not by being a Pharisee of the Pharisees and a tribe of Benjamin and keeping the law and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he was simply saved by God's grace. He was so grateful for the grace of God in his life. He felt indebted to go back to that world of humanity and tell them how they could be saved. So do you feel that indebtedness to other people? And not only indebtedness to the world of humanity, but indebtedness to the Jew. I'm a Gentile woman. Without the Jews, I would not have my Bible. Without the Jews, I would not have my Savior. Oh my goodness. That's a huge debt of love to repay whether they know I owe them or not. <laughs> you know, we're obligated. We're the branch that's been grafted in, aren't we? We should never forget who we are, whose we are, and the debt that we owe the Jewish people. So Paul was informed so that he could intercede and get involved because he was indebted indebted to the Jew, indebted to humanity, and indebted, indebted to the Lord Jesus Christ who had saved him by his grace. Oh, my goodness. What could we, you know, we, we can't pay off that debt, can we? But we can lay down our lives. One life would not be enough to just pay Jesus back for all that he's done for us. So we live our lives abandoned to him. So if you're going to have a heart for the gospel, conscious of God's call, convinced of God's compassion, so much so that you're informed, you intercede, you get involved because you're indebted. And lastly, you're confident in God's cross. The same power that brought forth everything into existence that had no existence in, in creation, the same power that brought his children out of Egypt, out of slavery with a strong, powerful hand, and then the same power that opened up the Red Sea so that they could cross over on dry ground, the same power that rolled back the Jordan River so they could cross into the Promised Land, the same power that brought down the walls of Jericho, 
The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that transformed Saul of Tarsus into Paul the Apostle, that same power is available today. It has not been depleted, diluted. There is power in the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, there is. Verse 16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And the Apostle Paul was so faithful, wasn't he, to take the gospel first to the Jew. Every town he went, he went to the synagogue first. When they ran him out, then he went to the Gentile. So, are you confident that there's power in the cross of Jesus Christ? to transform lives today, Gentile or Jew. We're sharing the gospel with a, what I would call a righteous Jew and a lovely, lovely man whom I dearly love. And I'd shared the gospel with him multiple times, but this last time I was just a little bit bolder. And so then he just was honest with me. He said, Ann, I believe there are two tracks. And you're on one track to God, but I'm on another track to God. And I thought, oh, no, I didn't argue with him. But Paul said, the power of the gospel for the Jew first and then the John is the same gospel. There are no two tracks. So there's power in the cross. And I just want to pick up on the phrase in verse 16 that says it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Has anybody ever asked you, huh, you know, what are we saved from? I don't need to be saved. So, of course, we're saved from an empty way of life. We're saved from futility. We're saved from darkness. We're saved from ignorance. We're saved from, you know. But one of the primary things we're saved from, can I just tell you, is hell. So I don't hear too many people do this, and I don't want to be offensive, but this is what the Bible says. I'm going to describe hell to you. And I won't give you the text, that, but it's a biblical description, okay? Hell is a place of great suffering, weeping, gnashing of teeth. The only time I gnashed my teeth was in childbirth because <laughs> it hurt. It was so painful. And hell is a place of intense physical torment forever and ever. Hell is described as a bottomless pit. If I fell into a bottomless pit, I would feel like I was always falling. I was never safe. And hell is described as a lake undulates, changes, you'd never feel like you were standing on solid ground, always feel insecure. Hell is a place of total darkness where the sun never rises, it never shines. People say, well, you know, I'm going to go to hell, all my friends are there, we're going to have a party. Well, your friends may be there, but you're not going to see them. It's dark. You're going to hear their screams of agony, but you'll be in darkness, and it's a place of solitary confinement, and you're all alone in hell. And you know, the worst time when I'm sick is in the middle of the night when it's all dark. There's nothing to distract me from the pain and the agony. And hell is like that on steroids forever and ever. Hell is described as a fire place of intense thirst, dissatisfaction, torment. Remember the parable Jesus gave about the man who just said, put just a drop of water on my tongue, but it wasn't possible. Worst aspect of hell is that you're separated from God forever. The one who created you, the one who loved you, the one who gave his son for you. And you're separated from, you can't see him, can't know him, can't ever be in his presence. So let's read the verse again. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile, because we're all going to hell if we don't put our faith in Jesus. And Jesus doesn't condemn us to hell. It's our sin that condemns us. So if we just keep on in life the way we were born, and we're all born sinners, Romans 3 23 says that we've all sinned, all come short of God's glory. So if we just keep on living our lives the way we were born, then we're just going to cruise right into hell. Which is why God so loved us that he gave us his only begotten son that when we place our faith in him, we would not go to hell, <laughs> but would have everlasting life. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, 
separation from God, hell when we die, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the power of the cross is still sufficient to change hearts today, whether they be Jewish or whether they be Gentile. And I know right now the Jews have that hardness and their blindness, but we were talking at dinner last night, and something's going on in the Jewish community. And I know Eris could probably, maybe has already told you about that, but it's, it's like the Spirit of God is beginning to move in the hearts of his people. And I don't know if I'll be alive to see those blinders come off and the eyes opened and them mourning for someone as for an only son, turning to Yeshua as their Messiah. But that time is coming. So in what are you trusting to change lives? I was invited um, recently to be on a televised panel discussion on racial healing and reconciliation. So um, I accepted. I thought it was very worthwhile. And the moderator told me he would save me to last. So I said, okay. So it was a panel discussion. So the moderator interviewed the different panelists. And as they shared one by one, they shared that they believe that in order to change our nation, in order to change people, that the foundation of our nation needed to be destroyed. They believed that the Ku Klux Klan had infiltrated the police, so they needed to be defunded and done away with. They believed that we were saturated with systemic racism. So when it got to me, the moderator said, all right, Ann, what do you think? So I had to bite my tongue, and then I just said, you know, I disagree with most of what I've heard. But there was a panelist, uh, a white guy that was on the panel, and he had been raised as a skinhead, Nazi, he hated blacks. And then he'd heard the gospel, <laughs> and his life was transformed. And when he was on the panel, he was serving on the pastoral staff of a black church in the Deep South. So I turned to him, and I said, what changed your life? It wasn't marching in the streets. It wasn't breaking windows. It wasn't defunding the police. It wasn't joining Black Lives Matter. It was the cross. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, Listen, don't forget the message. There is power in the cross to change hearts and to change lives. Black, white, Jew, Gentile, Arab, Israeli, Muslim, you know, whoever. There's power in the cross to transform human life. So that same principle that I gave that panel applies to the Middle East, doesn't it? It's the power of the cross that will bring reconciliation between Jew and Arab and Israeli and Palestinian and all that's going on there. The purpose of the cross, verse 17, in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that's by faith from first to last. So for the, from the first time when you are converted and you meet Jesus, you put your faith in him, you're made right with God but then you grow in your righteousness until the last day when you see him face to face. So some people come to the cross, they get their ticket to heaven, and then they just feel like they go back to live their lives the way they've always lived them. But we come to the cross, we put our faith in Jesus, we're saved by faith, and that same faith that saves us is the faith we live by. We don't live by our own wits, our own common sense, our own logic. We live by faith in the Son of God who loves us and gave himself for us, right? And it's a righteousness that's imparted and the righteousness that's imputed, but we, so we're saved and then we're sanctified. The power of the cross is to sanctify us. Three years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer and I went through surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. Radiation was every day for a month, and I would go to the hospital, they would lay me down on this machine, then the little technicians would run out, <laughs> then the machine would come down, and I'd hear the beep and the whir and the whatever, and I knew I was being radiated. The idea being that what the surgery didn't get, then the chemotherapy would get, what the chemotherapy missed, then the radiation would get, 
And the idea was that every day when I went through that radiation, it would break down any cancer cells that it found until they would be broken and dissolved and they couldn't do their destructive work. Can I just tell you, the blood of Jesus is like that radiation on cancer. So when we, we come to the cross and we're forgiven of all of our sin, past, present, future, all of our sin was future to Jesus when we were saved. But we come back to the cross every day to confess our sin, not only to be restored in our fellowship with him, but to break that hold that sin has because we still sin, don't we? To be honest, we're saved, but we're still sinners in our habits and our thought patterns and our actions. And every time we're aware of sin, we bring it to the cross, apply the blood of Jesus, and increasingly like that radiation on cancer. The blood of Jesus weakens the sin, weakens the hold until we can be set free. Yes, you can. You don't have to live in depression. You don't have to live in that bondage. You're no longer a slave to sin. You've been set free. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. That happened when you were converted and to cleanse you every day when you come back to the cross. So the cross isn't just for them. The cross is for me. And the cross is for you. We live at the foot of the cross. And our gratitude for what God has done sends us back out to share the gospel with the world. So, do the characteristics of a heart for the gospel match your heart? Are you conscious of God's call? Call, first of all, to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When was the last time you spent time with him? Not to prepare something, not to give out, not to really study, but just be in his presence without looking at your watch for the purpose of then making him known, sharing the gospel. When was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody one-on-one? And are you so convinced of God's compassion for the whole world that you're willing to make the time to be informed and then to intercede? And get involved as God leads you because you're indebted. And then lastly, are you so convinced, confident, in the power of the cross. You know what your message is, you know what your mission is, and you give out the gospel to the Jew first as God brings them across your path, and then to the Gentile while you are growing in righteousness. So that 1 Corinthians says, we're changed from glory to glory till other people can see Jesus in us. That's the purpose of the cross, to save us and sanctify us for God's glory. So my challenge to you, if you're like me, would you ask God to enlarge your heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Pray with me, please. And I don't know if there'll be somebody here maybe somebody who works here, somebody who'll be watching, but you've never come to the cross for salvation. And I don't feel I can give a message like this without extending to you the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ by faith as your Savior. And it's so simple that you can miss it, but you just come to the cross by faith. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you want to do that right now, let me pray. And then you pray after me. Very simple. Dear God, I bow before you and I'm deeply aware that if I were to die today, I'd come under your judgment. I would go to hell. That terrifies me. I want to be saved. And so I'm coming to the cross right now believing there's power in the blood of Jesus to save me. So I believe Jesus died on the cross.
for me, if I was the only one who needed to be saved, I believe he would have died for me. And I ask that you would cleanse me with his blood. Forgive me. I claim him as my savior. And I believe Jesus rose up from the dead to give me eternal life. And I believe eternal life is a right relationship with you now, but heaven when I die. And I open up my heart. I choose to turn away from my sin and invite Jesus to come live inside of me, take control. And I know he'll come in in the person of the Holy Spirit who will never leave me, never forsake me. From this day forward, I choose to follow him all the way to heaven. And I pray this in his name. Listen, if that's your prayer, somebody who's watching, somebody who's listening, then God has heard. It's not your words. It's the faith in your heart that God responds to. So you're saved. Welcome to God's family for the rest of us. Father, I ask now, please, that you set our hearts on fire for the gospel. That in this craziness in which we're living, people so desperate to be saved, Lord, we're, oh, we see the people falling out of the trade towers and the people falling off of that airplane and we want to scream and cry, but there are people all around us, Lord, that are falling, spiritually speaking, into destruction and judgment. Oh, Lord God, in the short time that there is left, use us to share the gospel in such a way that people's hearts and lives are changed. Give us an enlarged heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, please, Lord, we ask. We surrender our hearts to you for that purpose. Give us opportunities to share the gospel. Give us courage to open our mouths. <laughs> Even if we do a bad job, Lord, you can take it and clean it up and wing it into people's hearts so that they respond. Thank you for Joel. Thank you for the Joshua Fund. Thank you that when I went on that website, over and over and over again, I saw reference to the gospel. Thank you for the clarity of his vision, his mission, his message. So we ask your blessing on the rest of this uh, time together, on this epicenter briefing, and uh, we thank you for the blessing we've received, and we look forward to what else you have for us, and we make this commitment. I don't want, Lord, I pray that any decisions that are made would not be snatched away by what comes after us. But um, seal it in our hearts, please. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Subscribe to our videos by clicking the subscribe button. You'll find some videos that we've chosen specifically for you. And if this is a ministry that you'd like to support financially, just make a tax-deductible donation by clicking here to visit our giving page. Thank you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.